I learned that the rejection was every no got me closer to a yes. That not every product was perfect, but I could take those same skills, even in failure, and translate them. If you introduce compassion, and you look at the needs of the people that work for you, right from the beginning, I think you're gonna have stronger companies, less turnover, and better results. My thing is learning, learning whatever's new, and applying it in ways that other people aren't thinking of. Top 10, top I got a top 10, got my motivation high for my top 10, top 10. gotta learn from the wise women and men, and men. all my life. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something more inside you too. You have Michael Jordan level talent at something. So get ready to be great at selling, go all in, and find your gift with Mark Cuban and my take on his top 10 rules of success to give you the confidence, motivation, and belief that you need. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Be great at selling. If you come up with an idea where you say, I can make dollar bills for 50 cents, would you go out and raise money or would you just go out and sell it? You just go out and do it, you know, and, and that's what you have to do. And look, we all go through that fear factor of, do I quit my job? Do I, can I do this? Um, can, I, can I do this and what happens next? The one thing I, I know with 100% certainty and what I would tell myself is, if I can sell and become a better and better salesperson and be great at selling, I'm always gonna be successful whether I'm working for myself or if the company that I started just didn't work. I'll, t I'll give you an example. Um, out of Indiana, um, before I, I went down to Dallas, I, I needed to start something and um, I decided that Everybody drank milk, and I found this product, powdered milk, that was cheaper, and everybody needed to save money. And I was going to go out there and sell it um, because it was cheaper. Now, it didn't taste quite as good, <laughs> and so what I've, but I went out there to try to sell it. Failed miserably. But I learned how to make the sales effort even when things weren't going right. I learned that the rejection was every no got me closer to a yes. That not every product was perfect, but I could take those same skills, even in failure, and translate them. So that what I learned selling garbage bags door to door, what I learned from selling powdered milk that was awful, what I learned from selling local area networks at Micro Solutions, all those things accumulated and I, I got better at selling. So I always knew, you know, people always say to me, if you lost everything, what would you do? I can sell. I can sell, and it's not about selling ice to Eskimos. It's not about you know, convincing people to do this. Selling is always about helping. Selling is always about understanding the person you're talking to and what their needs are. And if someone can help me make my life easier, yeah. People, you know, now with employees, people always say, well, like, what's the definition of a great employee? someone who can reduce the stress of those around them. And it's the same thing. What's the definition of a great salesperson? Someone who can reduce the stress of their salespeople. And if in looking at your company and looking at your, your life and looking at your goals, if you're able to go out there and recognize that whether it works or doesn't work, you're putting yourself in a position where you're helping somebody, not convincing somebody, but, and you're reducing their stress. You're gonna, you're gonna be okay. It's gonna work out. And you know, that's the confidence I, I've, I've built in myself that wasn't necessarily always there. Um, but I learned that if I try to help, if I reduce people's stress, good things can happen. Rule number two, innovate. What is your thing and when did you kind of understand what I mean, it was? It hasn't changed. My thing is learning, learning whatever's new and applying it in ways that other people aren't thinking of. And so when I started, I got fired from a job selling software, started a company, and within six months, this was the early days of PCs, I recognized that, okay, we need to connect PCs together. Back then, you walked around and you had your <laughs> five and a quarter inch floppy, and you know, who would need to connect a PC? 
we started you know, writing software for local area networks, became a systems integrator, $30-some million run rate, and sold it to um, H&R Block. And then got to the internet. Okay, let's look at this internet thing. Someone's going to need to put audio and then video on there. Great. And then after Yahoo did Yahoo, right, I'm like, you know what? I'm looking at these big screen TVs that cost $30,000 that are high definition television sets and I'm thinking, you know what, eventually they're going to follow the price performance curve of traditional, of traditional um, consumer electronics. And they're going to come down in price. So I started the first all high definition TV network called HDNet. Then I'm looking and saying, okay, you know what? It's like 2006, 2007, and traditional television and cable is going um, digital. I'm saying, you know what? There's going to be more, a lot of storage space and first access digital space that cable companies aren't used to using. So let's take um, a movie production company that we created and let's make it available for day and day distribution where people can will pay 20 bucks. Um, to the, the cable company to watch this brand new movie and we get to keep 10 of it. And so we um, had 29, 29 productions. We started producing movies and lo and behold, the first movie we created was a, a documentary called Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room. <laughs> got nominated for Academy Award, then we didn't really create any good ones after that. But by being first leveraging digital storage, we were able to take advantage and make a lot of money. And, and in the NBA with the Mavericks, you know, just doing those types of things. And it's what I like to do now. Rule number three, go all in. I grew up, um, my dad did upholstery on cars. My mom did odd jobs. My mom, when I was in high school, was worried about whether or not I could have a career and you know, made sure she hooked me up with a family friend to learn how to lay carpet because she wanted me to know a trade just in case things didn't pan out um, if and when I went to college. So yeah, there was, it wasn't like, oh yeah, this is destiny and you know, my parents are gonna hook me up or you know, I knew this was gonna happen. It, it was, you know, who the hell knows what's gonna happen, but I, I, was, I was all in for wherever direction it went. Rule number four, be different. You talked about companies having a, a unique advantage. Can you speak more on that for me, please? Sure, I mean, what is it that, that a customer can get from you that they can't get from anybody else? And you have to be very careful with that too. When I just talked about lying to yourself as an entrepreneur, because often we'll say, well, it's just like Uber, but it has pink cars. Uber doesn't have pink cars. That, that's a, a difference without a distinction, right? Lots of times people get confused between what's a product and what's a feature. Pink Uber cars, that's a feature. That's not a unique product. Excuse me, so you have to know what it is that you do that is so unique, people, the people, your potential customers say, whoa, I did not know that. As opposed to, well, let me go tell Uber that they should probably add pink cars. Because whenever you're competing with, you know, all of you are going to compete with Amazon at some point, if you're not already. Just the reality. And so you've got to understand, when Amazon starts looking at my customer base, what is it that I can convey to them that makes me unique? And that's, that's what I meant by unique difference. Also, if you wanna have more confidence and self-love, check out my 254 series, they're free. The links to join are in the description below. I've always been passionate. Some people thought, you know, it's, a, it's more OCD than anything else. I always did everything back ass half words. You know, I, I, I like to, to challenge myself. Those back-to-back -back experiences confirmed what I already knew, that, that I was a ass employee and then I better start my own. Rule number five, always keep learning. Now I'm going through and teaching myself neural networks and you know, doing the same thing with machine learning and GANs and this and that because AI is going to have more of an impact than the internet did. AI plus new types of chipsets plus 5G is going to change things far more than we've ever seen anything change. And understanding where and how to apply it is going to be critical, but just as important, knowing how to se se um, segregate and separate the bullshit yeah. Right is as important because every email y'all are about to send me is going to say, I have this AI solution and we're using algorithms. <laughs> yeah, of course you are, right? And then what? What really makes you different? What really sets you apart? But if I didn't do that work, if I didn't sit down and do the AWS machine learning tutorials, if I didn't go on YouTube and take you know, the NYU introduction to neural networks or whatever, I'm not going to know it, I'm not going to be able to apply it, and I'm not going to be able to be first. And that's fun. That's fun. Knowing I get to kick the ass of some 22-year-old NYU graduate, that's awesome. Rule number six, find your gift. 
my dad busted his ass. I mean, he worked six six days a week. Um, left at seven at seven seven thirty in the morning. Got back at six or seven o'clock. Um, lost his eye in an accident doing upholstery. He had a staple break when he was putting um, um, some covering on a car seat. Um, you know, it was it was a, a middle class upbringing. My mom did odd jobs. You know, they, they just wanted something better. I mean, my grandparents came over from Russia and, you know, my dad was the first generation. My uncles were the first generation Americans, like my mom too. And, you know, like every child of immigrants, they wanted better for their kids. You know, it's funny. I mean, a lot of people grew up that way, uh -huh. right? But not many people end up like you. So what do you think that's the result of? I think, you know, everybody's got something that they're good at. And the hard part is just finding it. And I found out early that I was a good salesperson, that I really liked business. You know, like I like sports. I mean, I read everything I possibly could, played sports as much as I could, just wasn't as good as I wanted to be. And, and business was the same way. I mean, as long as I could remember, I was buying and selling baseball cards, garbage bags, whatever I could find, stamps um, to collectors. But I was also reading everything I possibly could about business. And, you know, I was that unusual kid that, I'd rather read about Ted Turner than go to the movies. And, and so I think that created a foundation. And my parents, you know, my dad used to always say, I don't understand what you're doing, <laughs> but I'm glad you're doing it. And, and so I had my ups and downs along the way, of course. But um, I just think that I just, I just put in the time and was fortunate enough to really get excited about business. And that paid off benefits over the long haul. Rule number seven, have self-awareness. You've never been shy to speak up on issues that are important to you. Yep. And one of those themes I've found has been around fairness. Uh -huh. And whether that's, you know, calling out referees for not calling games consistently or, you know, calling out a Shark Tank contestant because you think that they're scamming their customers. Right. How do you decide what you're going to speak up on or do you hold inside? You know, it, it's changed over the years because um, I have kids, because social media, you know, Twitter in particular is so much different um, and has changed kind of the rules of engagement. Um, it's changed because of what I went through with the Mavericks last year. I missed a sexual harassment problem that we had because I wasn't, I took my eye off the ball. Um, and so, you know, I, I try to be self-aware and try to put myself in the shoes of the person or people or organization I'm talking about, whether it adds value. Um, I try to put myself in the position, my own position, you know, how's it going to be perceived and, you know, is it worth it? You know, will it create more good than challenges? Right. And and so you've got to pick your spots. Rule number eight, have compassion. How people perceive entrepreneurs is changing dramatically and how entrepreneurs are contributing to society is changing right now as we speak. And I see it on Shark Tank, right? Companies coming on Shark Tank now, particularly from younger entrepreneurs, have a social component, right? You don't want to buy something unless you think the company is contributing. Right. And even more so now, a lot of people are saying, you know what, if you're an entrepreneur and you happen to get rich, that's bad, right? And so entrepreneurs, people particularly in my generation, have kind of segregated themselves into, okay, just get me all the money I can, into, okay, there can't be such a thing as compassionate capitalism. And really, it's falling on you guys now to set the message. If you going to, are going to be an entrepreneur, having a social component is good. Being a compassionate entrepreneur is better because when you can change things, when you can hire people, like I had to go back through the companies that I control now and I said I wanted to make sure that nobody who works for, in, in particular the arena and the Mavs, is on public assistance. Because it's wrong, I think it's wrong that somebody who works for me doesn't make enough money to be on public assistance. That's the type of attitude I think that needs to change now with entrepreneurs. And that's now becoming part of your responsibility and I think that's critically important. You know, guys like me, women like me can, can look and, and backtrack and backfill and where we've made mistakes and I've made plenty and I've learned from them. But it's your opportunity and I think it's critically important to recognize that you are gonna set the tone for how people perceive entrepreneurs going forward. And if you introduce compassion and you look at the needs of the people that work for you right from the beginning, I think you're gonna have stronger companies, less turnover, and better results. Rule number nine, recognize other people's skills. Being, treating people equally is not, is not the same, is not recognizing who they truly are and taking advantage of their skills. You know, 
And I've, I've learned that through Sint. I've learned that through all this. And, you know, like Sint and I talk, we'll be a much better organization. I'll be a better exec. I'll be a better investor. I'll be a better um, shark um, because I recognize that, you know, treating people equally is not the same as treating them, it, recognizing their skills and their differences. And for this, for this audience, it's, it's critically important. You know, and I think there's an opportunity now, and I know, hopefully, you know, people like me will recognize that the old white guys, now newly old white guys that are in positions of power, that there are things that you can do that I can't do. That, I, that there are things you see that I don't see. There are opportunities that you can create that I can't create. You know, we were trying to sell to the, the black community through the Mavs with multiple white men. We were trying to sell to moms with multiple white men. It's not that they're not capable. It's not that they're not skilled. It's just everybody brings something different to the table. And as an entrepreneur, you have to recognize what the differences are that you bring to the table, and you have to be brutally honest with yourself, right? You can't lie to yourself like we all lie to ourselves as entrepreneurs. But those differences can be part of your unique skill set like I talked about earlier. And now I'm finally starting to recognize those things. And you know the one thing I know? It's gonna make me a load more money. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is have fun. Are you ready to help us get the country really hooked on our smoked fish dip? <laughs> <laughs> this is good. The ones that have made me the most money have always been the craziest. Don't quit your day job. Oh my God! Can I get a volunteer to come up? Can we both? <laughs> That's a little bit too weird for me. Can you do this? <laughs> you don't want to get into a pillow fight with me. Oh, I'm going to destroy no, you, Robert. We're not pillow fighting. <laughs> oh. Get up, you wuss! Put that rock on the ground! Now I've got a special bonus clip from Mark on how to take risks that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the three-point landing question. Let's go from just watching a video to taking action. Here we go. Question number one. How can you have more fun in your business? Number two. Where do you need to have more compassion? And number three, what do you need to go all in on? And if you're still here, you made it this far in the video, I wanna celebrate you. Give me a hashtag, believe down in the comments as well. Do you think that's a prerequisite for successful entrepreneurs in the sense that, you know, obviously you've met so many and you know, your story you know, may not be as rare as I think we would probabilistically mm -hmm. assume, you know, the ability to grind and you know, get through those, those tough times. And do you think that that's something that's that, that's consistent with all entrepreneurs or? Depends how old you are. You know, a 45 year old entrepreneur, or 60 year old entrepreneur is gonna be different than a 24 year old entrepreneur. What was I gonna lose? I mean, literally I had a Fiat X19 that had a hole in the floorboard. I mean, you could tell I was living the high life, right? I mean, and I was putting in oil every 60 miles and, you know, working as a bartender at night. What did I have to lose? Right. You know, and so it wasn't like, oh man, you know, this is, I could lose all this. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah. and so it was just like, you just go for it. Right. Now, later on, after I'd had some success and we got back and we started AudioNet, which turned into broadcast.com, the, the math was different. The equations, you know, the calculus was different. It was like, okay, I'm investing a lot of my saved money into this whole idea of netcasting, right? Or internet broadcasting in early 1995 when people didn't even know what the internet was. That was all risk because I literally was putting everything that I had on the line for something. People just laughed at me and said, wait, audio over the internet. You know you can turn on the radio. You know you know you can turn on a TV. Yeah, but you don't get it. Oh, that's just dumb, all right? You know, and, and so being able to overcome all that resistance, because remember back then, A, you had to have a PC, B, you had to know what a modem was and install it. C, you had to know what the internet was and then you had to download a TCP IP client that worked over a modem and then connected to a browser that you probably didn't even know what it was or how to download it. And we had to take it on faith that all this was going to grow. If you wanna see the top 10 I did on Kevin O'Leary, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. 
Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. Look around you in the world and see the problems people are having. Keep your eyes open, and when you discover one that you think you can fix, that is the beginning of a business, my friend.